So I'm happy to talk here. I'm also a little bit stressed um, because uh, my research is about Kolmogorov complexity. But I will try to make the talk also a bit interesting for people with more applied interests. So I will try to talk about a little, at least a little bit and in a very philosophical way about real algorithms, but it's a bit out of my uh, comfort zone. So please correct me any moment uh, if, I, if I tell something wrong. So this talk will be uh, uh, about uh, causal inference and the connection between um, minimal description length principle. So the connection between the two. Um, so the first, uh, so first the problem, we will consider the setting where there are only two variables, here x and y. So we, we have some information that gives us information about two processes. And we want to know whether x causes y or y causes x. Normally if two variables are statistically dependent, it's generally believed that one of the three settings are valid. Right? Either x drives y, y drives x, or there is some common uh, uh, course, uh, some common process that drives both of them. Right? But we will not consider the middle one. Hmm? So th there are many examples. Um, uh, well, well, first another, uh, uh, some obvious solution. When the two, two variables are statistically dependent, one can often use time to break the symmetry between the correlation, uh, the dependencies. So if one process is known to happen earlier than the other, and one has to choose between these two scenarios, then time can break the symmetry. But this is, of course, what, what we're not going to discuss about. An example of such a case is Granger causality, when we analyze time series. Then there is actually some repeated, uh, uh, repeated statistical dependence for each sample in the time series. And then it's broken basically by assuming that um, one of the processes should happen earlier than the other. So in the second part, so we, I will consider two, setting par two settings. First, where we have some an ensemble, some uh, where we uh, gather information about X and Y in many small samples, which are drawn independently. The other setting is where we just have one chunk of information about X and one chunk of information about Y. So the second, the, and, and the answers in both settings will somehow be opposite to each other. So um, there, there are many funny stories where um, people infer the wrong direction. For example, if someone co uh, claims that um, firemen causes um, a burning a fire to be larger, because there is some correlation between large fires and many firemen to be somewhere. So, a wrong inference can be firemen causes a fire to be larger. Other, but more intelligent correlation is, of course, uh, the other direction. If the fire is large, then more firemen come. The, the, there is, um, I, I found on the internet, okay, I was surfing too long yesterday on the internet, but I found some f funny story. Um, so the, the, there was some study and that says that people who often drink soft drinks like Coca-Cola, they turn out to be more fat. So the, the obvious first idea is that, okay, uh, Coca-Cola and other soft drinks, they're full of sugar, so this sugar makes you fat. But then the, the, there was follow-up study and they, they said, um, actually this correlation is completely explained by people who drink diet soft drinks, like Coca-Cola Zero. It's very popular in Europe and US. So then the, this explanation that the sugar makes you fat doesn't work anymore because there is no sugar. There are almost no calories in these diet products. But then people say, ah, okay, but if you are fat, then you think I will be clever. I will drink uh, Coca-Cola without any calories. So the, the uh, the causality works in the other direction. Being fat makes you drink these diet products. But then there, there, there was another study with rats. So they feed it fake sugar to rats and then see what happens with their appetite. And then they found that fake sugar 
increases appetite for other food. And there is some biological explanation that, um, that, that there is some energy regulation mechanism in the body. And uh, when it sees that it's not correlating, that taste does not correlate with calories, it becomes aggressive. And therefore, you're more hungry. So it turns out that the original soft drinks make fat is true, according to this study. So there are some references in the bottom. So this is just a funny anecdote. Of, um, uh, as a funny illustration of selecting between these two uh, hypotheses. This is a large subpopulation. One can try to find a causal relationship. One can also try to look at just um, uh, single objects which are created by process X and Y. And it's possible to infer causal directions uh, when you have just single strings. You receive just single strings. Uh, from each of the sorts. And there is an example which was invented by Sasha Shen. Um, and he said the following. So we are given um, uh, two strings, two, two strings, uh, and one of them is the input of a machine and one of them is the output. So the first string is, represents a pair of prime numbers and the other string represents the product of these prime numbers. Now there is in cryptography a common assumption that factorization is hard. Now if we use this assumption, it's obvious what should be the input of the machine and what should be the output. The input is the pair of prime numbers and the machine has multiplied them. Um, if, the, if the input was the, uh, the product, then the machine should have factorized these random prime numbers. And this is generally believed to be computationally too hard. So there is a case where, um, where uh, there is a case of special strings that somehow have an inherent causal construction. But to uh, create such strings, we use some hardness assumption from complexity theory. This is a question, can, can we come up with an example that does not use a hardness assumption? And the answer is yes. But we have to, um, to, to change the problem slightly. We, have to, we need to assume a machine, and the machine is used several times in a row, and, and there is connection between uh, the, the several uh, iterations. So the machine is somehow learning. And in this case, it's possible to, to prove it without a, a hardness assumption. So this will be the first part of the talk, and this will be the second part of the talk. OK? So then there was Kolmogorov complexity in the title, you remember? Uh, can yes? you repeat please, what is hardness assumption? Hardness assumption means that um, there is no polynomial time algorithm that factorizes uh, numbers. Um, okay. But, but in the title, there is Kolmogorov complexity. So now I will motivate a bit why Kolmogorov complexity is at least in some philosophical level useful for studying causality. Let's first look to the problem of independence. So uh, when you're correcting an exam, you, you have sometimes the problem of independence when you see, see two suspicious copies of students who might have cheated. Um, then basically you're deciding, are these independent, yes or no? So imagine in the extreme case, you, 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 you give some or an exam question and you receive some complicated calculation that can be done in many ways. You receive two identical copies and then you just conclude, I'm sure they have cheated. So then the question is, who has cheated? But okay, now we're talking about independence. Um, so, in some cases, you're just directly sure. But imagine the question is, uh, compute 1,000 decimals of some uh, mathematical irrational constant of your choice. And then two students, they come up with 1,000 with uh, decimals of pi. Two times exactly the same answer. But then you say, OK, th this is possible. Although the object is very large, it has some inherent structure, and then we are not, uh, not afraid of uh, independence. So the students might be honest, although they gave exactly the same answer. So what's the difference between these two? 
it is that these numbers of pi have very large, very little information. But then we must define what we mean by information. And this is exactly, so, so here we see that the probability of cheating is related to the information content. The same thing with the prime numbers, also there is some probability the machine might ha have guessed a factorization, but this is unlikely. So when we use Kolmogorov complexity, we get rid of two things, of the probability and the inherent difficulty of the strings. So that is why it's nice to use Kolmogorov complexity, at least for people who work in theory. The big question is whether it's also uh, really important for people who make programs and invent new algorithms. The question is whether they should study too. I don't know the answer. That's another question. Okay, but I'm uh, distracted now. Let's continue. So um, here is the overview. So I, I will give crash tutorial, small tutorial on Kolmogorov complexity, just one slide. Then I will explain the first setting, when this Kolmogorov complexity can give you uh, some inherent causality in just a single object. And then I discuss uh, about ensembles, like when you sample uh, some source independently very often. Mm. So here goes um, the definition of Kolmogorov complexity. So recall that, that we want to distinguish between highly random sources and highly structured sources. For example, these decimals of pi, they have loads of structure. So how discriminate between both of them? For this, we will use Turing machines. So we assume that, that we have a machine and it has two tapes, a work tape, is infinitely long, and it can contain a program. And the Turing machine computes and uh, writes his answer, his result of the program, on a separate tape, and then it's followed by blanks. So the Turing machine defines a mapping from strings to strings. Okay, there is something wrong with the slides. This why just imagine it, it's not there. Um, <clears throat> Or, or, or I can explain you the conditional definition. It can be that the machine first receives some auxiliary input, some y he can use to compute an x. So the machine will first read y, then use his program, and then write x on the tape. So this is the definition of conditional Kolmogorov complexity. We say that a Turing machine is optimal so first, the, the complexity of a string, given another string, is defined by the length of the minimal program needed here to transform the string y to x. So here, uh, the y and the x have disappeared. So here is the definition again. So there is something wrong with the slides. My apologies. Um, then the definition of optimal. We say a machine is optimal if for any other machine the complexity measure is smaller. So is everyone following? Maybe bigger, or any other maybe bigger? So the, the V is a Turing machine. So it's the example of a computer. For any uh, other machine, we have a different function, a different complexity function. But there exist special machines, which is called optimal that are maybe worse than another machine, but only worse by constant. And this is kind of, th these are just machines you who can simulate other machines. When we have uh, some compiler to simulate another computer, um, basically it works like this. So the, the program for the other computer is just a pre-compiler for, uh, for the program of the other. Uh, okay. So if we have two optimal machines, they define the same Kolmogorov complexity function within a constant. And um, <clears throat> so this means that if we just uh, have some inequality which holds within an additive constant, we don't have to fix the machine. We can just assume any optimal machine. Yes. So everybody is following? Yes? Okay, so, so we can derive some simple properties. For example, um, the complexity of x is bounded by the length plus some constant. Why is this true? So it's sufficient to just construct one machine 
and then we apply the optimality machine, then, then the optimality property. So I, I, if um, y is the empty string, we don't write y. So that is the meaning of c of x. So, um, <coughs> so we just have to prove the inequality for, uh, for one machine. And when you use the identity machine, so the machine that just maps p to x, then we, have this uh, then we have this equality. So for the machine that implements the identity function, maps the program just to itself. We have that the minimal program of a string. There is only one program, it's just a string itself. So the complexity on, on the trivial machine is just the length of the string. So that means when we switch to a universal machine, we know that complexity is always bounded by length of x plus o of 1. So switching to an, other, an optimal machine to an optimal machine can increase the complexity, but at most by a constant. Right? So the, the, then the, uh, there are strings which are highly structured. For example, the string that contains n zeros. So the inputs are bits, the outputs are bits. When we have n zeros, we can summarize a string with just log n bits. So the program is n in binary, so the size is just log n. And then the, pr the machine reads here log n and just outputs n bits. It just counts to n and then it halts. So therefore we see that complexity is at most log n plus o of 1. Then uh, most strings are random. That means at least a fraction, uh, 1 minus a little bit, of all n bit strings have complexity at least length of x minus c. If a function is computable, then we know that complexity of f of x is at most complexity of x. So how, how do we construct the machine? The machine, um, so first we make a special machine in which the complexity of f of x is small, and then we go to a universal machine by dropping the constant, and the machine just runs the program, simulates the program on the optimal machine, and then computes f on the output. So th this is uh, a, a simple equation. And here the constant depends on the function. Now if Kolmogorov, comp uh, Kolmogorov complexity is incomputable, and the reason why this is true is because of uh, some variant of Berry's paradox. Berry's paradox goes as follows. So consider the following number. The smallest number that has no description in less than 20 words. So we have, if this number is well defined, we have some problem because by definition it has less than 20 words, but also by definition it, it has more than 20 words. So a logic which allows for this statement to be uh, uh, mathematically definable has a big problem. Uh, and, and so the, a similar thing happens when we prove that uh, complexity is incomputable. So consider the fu following function, the function that maps n to the smallest string which has complexity larger than n. So by definition, complexity of f of n is bigger than n. But if f is computable, then we have complexity of f of n bounded by complexity of n bounded by log n. But this directly is uh, in contradiction with this. So therefore, our assumption, complexity is computable, cannot be true. So is this clear, this reasoning? So if f is computable, then we can compute, uh, if complexity is computable, then we can find this x. Just try all x's and wait until you find one which has high complexity. So f is computable. And if f is computable, complexity of f is smaller than complexity of n is smaller than log n, and we have a contradiction. So now you're finished the crash course on Kom Kolmogorov complexity, and we have even seen a small little proof uh, that complexity is not computable. But now people think, oh, I don't care about Kolmogorov complexity for two reasons. First, I don't care about compression. And second, I don't care about uh, things that are not computable. So m maybe I, I should try a pool. And, and, and so, uh, 
So for many people, it's a problem that this thing is not computable. Say, so how can this be interesting? Well, um, Kolmogorov complexity, it is also difficult to answer. Kolmogorov complexity is somehow a, a limit of what computable things can reach. So we're let, let, let us say that um, people all over the world, th th they are building better and better compressors and Kolmogorov complexity represents the limit of optimal compressors. So the, the, somehow it's a placeholder of optimal compression. So, th so um, unfortunately it's not computable, but this means that it somehow represented a black box where you can put in any compression algorithm and if this compression algorithm is optimal for some string, then you can conclude something. So, th so this is why I, I find it interesting. In my imagination, I see just a computable compressor that works nicely for some string. If the compressor doesn't work nicely, then the result is, is not applicable. Okay, but this is kind of informal philosophical thing. Um, Oh, the, the, there was one thing, symmetry of information, which I forgot to tell you. <clears throat> so the complexity of a pair equals the complexity of x. So the information in the pair x, y equals the information in x plus the information in y given x plus some small constant. So this is the last property we will, we will use. Okay, but now I continue with, with my uh, philosophical thing. So why do, should we care about compression? I think it, it's quite an important thing. And the reason is when people in machine learning try to fit some model, pro mostly they, they, they fit probabilistic models, right? But these probabilistic models have an interpretation in terms of compression, just by um, the, this Shannon Fano code, which is closely related to Huffman code. So Shannon final code gives you a method. So, so, so um, suppose you have some data Z and you can fit a very good probability distribution. That means a, a, a simple distribution for which your data has very large probability. But then you have a short program for this complexity, for, for, for your data. And this is by Shannon Fano code. It gives you a computable way to translate your probability to a short code. And the length of the code is just related by the log of the inverse of the probability. So the higher the probability, the shorter the code. And fitting probability distributions, this is quite an important problem. I think for anyone who, who does something with machine learning. So this is why I find it interesting. Kolmogorov complexity is also related to Shannon entropy. When we have many, many samples, and we apply a Huffman code or Shannon Fano code, then we can find uh, a short code for our samples. What we do is we encode our probability distribution, and then with high probability, the Shannon Fano code of your long string will be bounded by the entropy of your probability distribution. So that it should be PZ here, as Z is missing, right? So there, if people care about Shannon information theory, then there might be a reason also to care about Kolmogorov complexity because it's closely related, there is a close relationship. So, so another pro, uh, example, so, so you want to compress a time, so you want to model a time series. So you can have some program, uh, some regression model. So if you want to compress your time series, then you first store your, um, your uh, regression model and then you know that uh, um, the, the, the second part, which encodes the errors of your uh, compression model, can be small if the errors uh, are, are from some small entropy distribution. And this is interesting, the entropy of Gaussian distribution is some constant plus and then root mean square error, mean square root error. Right? So, so these things are tightly related and this is why I find them still important. So are there questions or objections? So I, I'm happy that people look less tired after explaining this motivation. So uh, 
This, this makes me uh, very happy. Okay, let, let's continue. So this was the slide with the introduction of Kolmogorov complexity. I should look a bit at time also. Okay, so we half an hour. Um, so let us look to, to, to the two exams with cheating uh, uh, students. And so if the students have cheated, let, let's say in the extreme case, x equals y. We can, um, <coughs> then we see that uh, the complexity of x plus the complexity of y is much bigger than the complexity of x and y together. We can give this uh, observation some um, interpretation in terms of minimal description length principle, but interpreted very freely. Suppose the students worked independently. So then they were just using, each was using their own program. So to explain this model, we somehow, because they're in separate locations, not collaborating, for the, we, we measure their complexity as the sum of both programs. If the students are sitting together, working intensively, uh, communicating with each other, then we can uh, model this process just by one single program. So the, the, the natural way to, to, um, to associate the complexity to a, a, a set of people who work independently is this people highly collaborating, uh, we can uh, measure their complexity in this way. And then we, we see that the sum, I, I, if the results are correlated, then the sum is much bigger than this. And in this way, we can define in some way independence. But of course, this is very rough approximation. There can be domain-specific uh, information encoded in it. So when we compare the complexity of homeworks, there is so much background information. So when we use such a measure of information, we are assuming that the background is not relevant. Yes? May I ask a question about this uh, criterion of independent work? Yeah. Uh, if uh, the work uh, has some real meaning, then there is uh, some kernel, something difficult to understand, uh, which uh, is elaborated by both students. Yeah. And this complexity is the same uh, for both of them. So uh, if some of complexities is close to the complexity of the pair, it means that uh, they make a totally random work, put some random words and uh, do nothing meaningful. Yeah, so th this, your comment relates to, remember the pi, the number, like um, if the task is compute pi, then of course it can be the yeah. same and then it's not working. But when you find a student who is cheating, you often find it by him making a mistake and this mistake can be random in yeah, any I place. See. But we need uh, somehow to um, elaborate this uh, well, if homework is to compute uh, yeah. uh, digits, uh, the digits of pi, then... <laughs> then it's not working because they're both very small. All complexities are small and it's difficult to compare them. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but the, the, it's a good point. We can only use this method when the information, when the huge, when we have huge files with loads of random information. And this is actually how it has been applied in some naive I mean, this naive philosophy has been applied in, in papers where they, they compare genomes and, and say, okay, this animal is very close to this animal because the genome is very uh, related and uh, other genomes is very unrelated. So, so here at HSE, there is Attila uh, uh, Kertes Vasquez, who works in bioinformatics, who has studied these compression algorithms. So, so the, there is a connection. But uh, indeed, like the background information, the purpose of the task um, makes a difference. But here we are assuming that the random noise is much bigger than all this domain-specific information. So the, the, the nice thing with these algorithms, which were given by Vitani, Trump and others, they just work independent of the domain. And the main assumption is that if there is uh, in, in independence, then these terms are equal, if there, if there is dependence, then there is a huge difference. 
So I, I, I admit that this is a very rough, simple ID, but it turns out that sometimes it works. And this is interesting because you have a program which works the irrelevant of the task, uh, the domain, uh, and so on. And this is empirical or it is not empirical? It is something which you cannot prove analytically? I no, no, you cannot approve this. Just an assumption we're making about the world. If two processes are separated uh, somehow, then we can assume that, that they acquire lots of different information. If processes are interacting, then we can acquire, they accumulate lots of similar information. It's just a principle. And the principle above it, I'm not sure whether I can say this, but I call it just minimal description length principle. So th there exist many ways to refer to this thing. Um, uh, and there are many interpretations, but I think when we, one uses Kolmogorov complexity, this is somehow a natural information uh, interpretation. If you have a hypothesis, you can somehow split the complexities. And this is what we will be doing now. So for example, let us look. Uh, so some more questions? How do you compare them if they're not computable? Well, we estimate them by real compressors. So in this article, they just replace complexity by the length which of the program produced by GZIP. So GZIP pr pr produces a file and just look at the length of the file. Very simple. So, so it, it's, um, when you, uh, there is a mathematical theory, when you apply it, you always make assumptions which might or might not be true. So if you go to the shop for some paint, to paint a round table, then the table is never perfectly round. It is also not two-dimensional because if you zoom in, there are these big... But you believe that your approximation is sufficient for the application. And then the question is, does it work, yes or no? Right? So, uh, is it uh, really necessary to use uh, uh, optimal compressor or, uh, for computation of uh, complexity? Do we need the optimal? No, if, if you find enough similarities between X and Y, you're happy. It, ca it might be that you don't find all of them. If you have enough of them, then you can find a difference. So, uh, am I right that you can use uh, just uh, the compressor who will copy uh, the homeworks and you will uh, calculate the compressor? Yeah, if they are identical, re yeah. Real late on the files. Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. So, for example, if the homeworks are just identical, then you are enough with a very simple compressor that just copies two times the same thing. So the Okay, so we have this example of uh, Sasha Shen, where we go a step further. We know there is a correlation and we can infer the direction of the correlation. So when we formulate this with minimal description length principle, how, how, what do we get? So, so now we will use, um, we use the hardness assumption. We say basically, if we cannot find it in polynomial time, we cannot find it at all. So we modify our definition for Kolmogorov complexity. We just say, uh, we use a variant where we fix some polynomials T and S and, and uh, we don't allow the programs to, be, uh, to, to run longer and then we look to the smallest fast program. And then we, we uh, compare the complexity of one side of the input and the complexity of the other side of the input given uh, this input. So this uh, scheme corresponds to the sum of these complexities, right? So here we consider programs that take the pair as input and return the product. Here we consider uh, programs that just generate the pair. And then we can compare the, uh, this scheme with this scheme in a similar way. Oh yes, I, I, I uh, yes. Yeah, so, sorry for my mistake. So th this should be switched. So and and um, then there is this hardness assumption in cryptography, 
given the product, oh, that's very unfortunate, here should be the product, and the hardness assumption in cryptography says, given a product of two primes, you cannot find any information about the primes themselves. So you cannot, on, so in cryptography, people use the assumption that you cannot only factor, you can also get no information about the factors themselves. And in this way, um, we can compare a causal approximation. But there, there is a problem when we don't have time bounds. And I just quickly showed it already before, there is symmetry of information. If there are no time bounds, this is just the complex equals the complexity of all, uh, both input and output. And here we also have complexity of everything. So these two are equal when we don't have time bounds. But it turns out there exists some more sophisticated setting where we can have such an asymmetry, when we have several rounds of interaction after each other. So this is the next part, when Kolmogorov complexity is asymmetric. <coughs> so the, to, to, um, to make sure, I, I give one more informal explanation about the problem we're considering now. So imagine there is theater play, so that there is some script, um, and the script consists out of two big pieces. And there are two settings. Either uh, there was a person. Uh, in the first setting, there are two actors. The first actor learns first part, second actor, second part. And the second setting, uh, th there is just one, se uh, one actor who learns everything. And the question is, in which setting the total studying effort is the most? Right? For one actor to study everything, eh? or the sum of the work of Alice plus the work of Bob. So Alice has to study the first part, Bob can listen to the first part and has to remember the second part. And then people say, okay, um, in both settings I think the work is about the same. Now consider a second scenario where there is one long dialogue, so with alternating lines, right? So again, the same question. One actor learns everything, or two actors, Alice and Bob, who, who learn even and odd lines. And then the question is, oh, in which scenario there is most work in total? So, so what do you think, and which intuitively, what's your... Okay, this is so. There is no right or uh, wrong answer because it's way about outside mathematics. So nobody, someone has an opinion? The so second the second in total is more work because, um, well, there are two ways of reasoning. So one can say, okay, Alice has only need Alice when he says his line, he just hears the previous line from Bob, so he doesn't need to remember him. He only has to remember the new information in his line. So the work of Alice is proportional to the sum of all information in his lines, new information in his lines. The work for Bob is the sum of all new information in his lines. So if we add up this information, we have the sum of all new information in each line, but this equals all information in the full script. So this suggests that the, the sum of work of Bob and Alice should equal the, the work of a single actor. But in practice, when you ask an actor, he will say, oh, if I just have to learn my lines of the whole dialogue, it's equal work. Because if I know my lines, I know the lines from the other two. So for the actors, it's the second case. It, it, it turns out to be much more. And then, then if, imagine you ask the uh, actors, what if you flip the lines? So first I say, I love you too, I love you. I am sad, I no longer love you. What's, is it more or less work to learn this? And people will say, oh, this will be much more work in the two actor setting. Okay, but, but this is kind of, of uh, 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 philosophy, which is not worth very much, except for just introducing the problem. Let's look what happens with Shannon entropy if we look to this problem. So when, when, the, when they have the setting of two big pieces, the script contains two big pieces, 
then we can apply Shannon information theory. So the, the definition is not important. What is important is that there is this uh, chain formula for information theory. Information in X equals information in Y plus X. Now, when we go to the two actor setting, we notice that also the conditional part works. So when we break conditional, when we split information in two parts conditional to some other information, we can still do it. And now we can break many parts. So we can quantify all the information in Alice lines and all information in Bob's lines. And after splitting in all the pieces, we see they're just equal. Now, when, what happens when we go to Kolmogorov complexity? We also have symmetry of information, but there there is some error. So here we have small error. And if we break in many pieces, then we have many O of 1 errors. If we break in N pieces, just bit by bit, we know the error gets bigger than these terms. So th there is th it might be that this is asymmetric. But first, the le first lesson is that we need better definition. How can we break into N pieces? And for this, um, I will use the work of, of uh, Kolya, Sasha, Vovk, and Chernov. They have introduced online version of Kolmogorov complexity. So first, let, let's repeat what, what is conditional complexity. So, so, so just let's look to one. Uh, let, let's look to the machine second. Uh, or or let, 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 me, let me explain again. So imagine there are two machines called first and second. The first one just write this on a common communication tape and the second one can read this and print this uh, on the communication type. So here the task is print XY on the common communication type and the work is distributed by two different sources. Yeah. Then the smallest program on the first machine is just the complexity of the first part which is X. The work of this machine, he can read X and has to print Y. So the sum of these, when we have optimal programs here and here, then the sum of the length of these programs just equals the complexity in X and Y, and this is just the, the theorem of Levin and Zwonken. Now we have the other task where the first machine has to print the odd bits, the even machine has to print the even bits, and they have to do it in turns. And then the definition is very natural. We just assume a machine that has a program and can read the bits that are printed so far, and it has to print the next bit. So th this complexity notion was introduced by Kolya, Sasha, and others. Now le let us look at some basic properties of, of this complexity notion. Um, first, the odd complexity is bounded by the length of the string divided by 2. Why is this? So the, the definition, uh, at least for one, it's clear, the others are a bit shy. So I should ask more questions. So this program has to print the odd bit. So here i is each time odd. So it has to print at most half of the bits. So it has to store at most half of the bits of x. So this is quite obvious. Um, odd complexity is smaller than the complexity because printing only the odd bits is just easier than printing everything. Then if we add up these two bounds, we find that there can be, uh, <coughs> we find that odd complexity plus even complexity is always bounded by length over half. So that means printing the same string um, with two machines cannot be too much harder than just printing with one machine. Uh, we, we also find the, the trivial upper bound. The, so, so we know that, that um, <coughs> when we compare the setting of one machine and two machines who interact, um, we have some bounds and, and there is lots of space be between them. Now we want to compare the setting where these bits are flipped. Right? We know that, that the, the bound, the difference between the complexity will also be within this bound. So then, and then, <coughs> so, so, so we can call this asymmetry of online information. And then I found uh, it was quite difficult proof, at least for me to, to invent. Um, then I found, uh, constructed some infinite sequence 
such that the complexity of even and odd bits are both as big as the complexity of x. So this confirms the setting where there are two actors having a dialogue. To, to have a dialogue, both of the actors has to remember the whole piece. There is no way around. And the strange thing is that if you flip the sentence in the dialogue, then just one dialogue has, needs to remember nothing. Doesn't need a, a, anything to remember. So there is kind of maximal asymmetry. And the asymmetry in terms of length is also pretty big. Oh yeah, so I also proved for if you have k actors, then it can happen that if you go around the dialogue um, b between k actors, then all k of them have to remember everything. But if you go around in the other direction, then only one has to remember things. So it's possible um, to show this. And this means that there exists some causal structure. Uh, I just quickly mention, uh, so, so there is also a, a bound in terms of the length of the string. So the gap can not only be large in proportion to the complexity, but also in proportion to the length. So we had this upper bound that, that the gap can be at most half of the length, and we have some number which is 0 0.232. So the, 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 it is uh, close to the length. And, and uh, the, the upper bound can be decreased a little bit. But th this is very difficult uh, computation. Um, okay, so, so what have we achieved? So, so let, let, let's have some other funny example. Um, imagine we have some human brain and then it has two parts, say an emotional part and a rational part. And then for some person, he has given some pictures or some stimuli or some information and you want to know it for this person, is there his rational part driving the emotional part or is his emotional part driving his rational part? So what do we have? I, after each uh, stimulation, we have some um, an information, of some measurements from emotional part and rational part. And then we want to know first emotional part, then rational part, or first rational part, then emotional part, and so on. And we assume that only one of these two uh, scenarios is the true scenario. So then we can have our uh, minimal description length principle and look for this sequence to the co sum of odd complexity and even complexity. And then the theorem, so here is the theorem just repeated, says that uh, this sum can be large for this and can be small for this. So it's theoretically possible. So there exist some strange strings for which this is possible. But I have to make some warning. So, so far, uh, things which I found exciting, um, but, but there is some bad news too. Because in, in reality, we have compressors are represented by computable functions. But here in the theorem, when we show that complexity of the reverse setting is small, we have not computable not a computable one. So this is the bad news. But on the other hand, if we insist on being practical, we want computable processors, but then we should push for polynomial time processors, uh, compressors. But then we have this example of Sasha, where asymmetry is restored even with one round of interaction. So this finishes the first part uh, of the talk where I show that from minimal description length principle, we can find strings which are intrinsically causal, but, and this I forgot to, to mention, but such strings have to be um, very special. They have to contain loads, they have to be anti-stochastic is the word which is often used. So we have uh, a person who has studied this quite intensively in the audience. Um, <clears throat> so this means these strings are not not really realistic. So the question is, is this something interesting or is this just a pathology of all this common or of complexity business? I don't know the answer. So uh, yeah, for me, the reward is inventing the proofs. So, uh, but for practicalities, I, I, I never know what to think about uh, these things. Okay, but now we will look at some more practical algorithms. And it really happens 
that people working in consulting, there are several of them, and their papers, they start to use Kolmogorov complexity. They really like it. So how is this possible? And now I will explain you this story. So now we are slightly, oh, first, first these models, they, they, what happens, they, they work in two stages. When there is a bunch of data, they, they, they try first to fit a model to the data. Then they forget about the data and continue working with this model. So now, how is, it, is this possible? And somebody who lives in the world of Kolmogorov complexity, where do the models come from? And what is a good model? What's a bad model? So we, we touched on this already uh, slightly. So the, the, there is this idea, um, so, so there is this concept of model fitting, where you look for models that um, achieve maximal compression. So what does it mean, maximal compression? A model has some complexity by itself. So when we, we for example, we, we, we um, have uh, a time series and we use re uh, regression to model this, then we have two parts in our estimate of complexity, the regression model and the probability of the error, which is proportional to root mean, squ uh, mean square root. Right? So if we sum them up, we can somehow measure the quality of the compressor. And when we're training the model, we make some trade-off between small complexity and a small error. So here this trade-off, when we consider this graph, it, it is just some uh, uh, explication of a trade-off. We want on one side small model, and on the other side a, a model that has small uh, error. These trade-offs can be done in many ways. So here I have uh, summed, them uh, summed them both. Um, but then there is a paper uh, that says, okay, there are many ways that the statist real statisticians use for uh, measuring these trade-offs, but in the world of Kolmogorov complexity, they, they, they give very closely related curves. And this was proven by Vitanyi and Vereshagen. So Vereshagen is here in the audience and he is um, the director of theoretical computer science at HSE. So, <clears throat> uh, okay, so uh, the, the such trade-offs, I, I think they're very familiar for, uh, familiar for people working on machine learning, right? So I studied a long time ago support factor machines and then they say we want big margins, then the, which means the model is simple because there are only few models with big margins and high dimensional data. And on the other hand, we want to reduce the error. And then but they say we don't know which, what is most important of the two criteria and then by just cross, um, how, how is it called? Cross validation. Cross validation. Thank you. Cross validation. We 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 check what is uh, uh, how how this what is most important in this trade-off with some linear coefficient. Um, okay, but once we have fitted our model, we can our model can de might it might be possible that our model detects some statistical uh, correlation or statistical dependencies, and we want to know the direction. So basically we want to factor our model and we have two options. Either we say first there is an X and then from Y, uh, from X, Y is generated. Or we have the other direction. And then there exists, so, so um, this theory cannot say anything about which is best. We need to make an additional assumption, but the additional assumption is a natural one. We will say that um, X is generated in one place and Y is generated given X is generated in another place. And if they're generated in independent places, then these functions should be independent. These densities themselves should be independent, contain small mutual information. So, th this, is, um, so, so this is the conjecture or, or the postulate, I call it, by Janzing, Scholkop and Lemaire. So they say, uh, well, if there exists a causal relationship between either X or Y, or between Y to X, then one, uh, for the correct relationship, this sum will be smallest. So it just means that um, <clears throat> for the other side, there will be a relation between PY and uh, PX given Y. 
Now again, this cannot be proven, but now that there is some nice um, uh, uh, empirical work to support this postulate. So the goal of the last part of the talk is, is to go over this empirical uh, idea. So I have 15 minutes, which is perfect timing. So, so is, is the statement clear? Is, is the statement of the uh, post... How do you, do you define the uh, complexity of distribution? Ah, okay. So, um, a, cost, a distribution, it maps data to some probability. Uh, yeah, yeah, which is uh, some real number between zero and one, say, rational number to keep things simple, right? So then you look to the shortest program that computes the correct rational numbers on input of the data. Uh, in terms of applications, it's not very... It seems it's uh, yes, you're right. So in, in terms of application, each time people have to go around this because this is like, even if you consider polynomial time computable models, it's NP hard problem or even much worse. Uh, um, so, uh, so it's true that in applications, people will say, um, uh, say some clever things that, that they say. Uh, okay, so imagine a nice example is that, uh, suppose Y is a deterministic function of X. Then they say, okay, the, uh, this function should have uh, this function f uh, should have no correlation with the density uh, conditional density which is one assumption so you compute the correlation between px as a function and the function that maps x to y so th this is kind of a method that's used there is an indirect method which i will explain in the second slide and hopefully this is more convincing for you um, so here I repeat the postulate. Uh, oh, sorry, one more slide. My apologies. Uh, we, we will just uh, do, do some example to make sure everyone understands uh, uh, the, the postulate. So imagine you are given, uh, you, you select an, a random number between 0 and 1, uniformly between 0 and 1, a real number. And then there is another variable, b, and it is 1 if the variable r exceeds some threshold, otherwise it's zero. Yes. So now let us look whether there is common information between the, the marginal and, and, and the um, <coughs> marginal and uh, conditional distribution. Yes. So here is the model. When t is uh, when our variable r is small, we set b to zero, and it's big, uh, we set it to one. So first, let, let, let us uh, uh, investigate the direction R causes B. So the conditional distribution, to describe the conditional distribution, we need a parameter T. To describe the marginal distribution, we don't have any parameters because it's just uniform distribution between 0 and 1. There are no shared parameters. Now for the other direction. So the decomposition happens like this. We need the marginal distribution of B is just uh, the area of this thing, which is T. Um, <clears throat> so if um, B equals zero, we have this area. If B equals one, we have this area. Um, the conditional distribution, when B is zero, it is uniform between zero and one, uh, zero and T, and otherwise it's uniform between T and one. So that means there is a shared variable. A shared variable that just means that uh, uh, one complexity is larger than the other. Which can be informally interpreted. This is just an example, right? So this shows that in principle it, it, it's uh, possible to discriminate be between the two. So if you use the wrong direction, then it means some fine tuning needs to happen. So when we have the wrong direction, we have to, to fine tune the, these conditional distributions. And this is unlikely. So for causality, people use um, independent uh, additive noise model. So have you heard, have you heard about this? Yes. Ah, okay, yeah. So, th so th we're just assuming that um, 
the cause is independent from the noise and the effect is just um, f of x plus some noise. Now, um, if this is the case, what we see, if we plot the variable y and x, then the noise for some fixed x, the, the, the data will be, in, in, so, so the variance, when we look at some vertical window, the variance will be constant in every window. But if we reverse the direction, then the, uh, the variance will change. Here we will have smaller variance, here we will have very big variance, and here we will have, again, small variance. So this means that the noise is no longer independent of y. This is, this is the basis of the method. So in practice, people use regression to get y from f of x, and then they just uh, compare whether x and y minus f of x are independent. Then you can reverse x and y, compute the same thing, and look what is best. And this is uh, a method to get cause, uh, causal relationship. Um, now, how does this method relate to the postulate? It turns out it nicely relates to the postulate. So the method only works for nonlinear f, right? It nicely relates because of this equation. This equation says that um, for the wrong direction, you can compute the marginal distribution from the conditional one. Okay, the computation is very bad because there is double derivative and you have to integrate twi twice and it's very noisy and blah, blah, but at least in principle there is a connection. Yeah, for not correct relation. So this means that the marginal and the distrib uh, conditional distribution, they have maximal mutual information. So if you sum them, it will be much big bigger than if you do it in the correct, uh, correct uh, way. So if there is time, I can convince you about this formula. It's just five lines. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. So th it's just five lines, so I hope... Uh, so, so we want to prove this, this equation. How can we do it? So we have to start from this distribution for x and y. So first we bring this to the other side. And then we note that so conditional product of conditional and marginal measure is just the, the uh, joint product density. So when we take logs and we bring this to the other side, we have good news. It's already simpler. And now we, um, we just plug in on one side our definition of joint distribution here. Here we use bias theorem. Uh, <clears throat> then we work a bit further. We expand the logarithms. We use the same trick as here. Everyone is following? Not everyone. So which step? So from here to here is just the definition. From here to here is the kind of definition of conditional probability distribution. It's called by bias law. How, do, how should I pronounce it? Yeah, everything I learned before the age of 18, I don't know the English translation. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so, so this is just. And then again, we write this as a product of x, uh, px, and pe. When we expand the logarithm, we have this thing. Right? So the, the gray is visible. Okay. So we have this thing. But then look, we, we are uh, taking partial derivative to x and y. So when we take partial derivative to x, this is a constant and we get rid of it. So that's why it's in gray. When we take partial derivative to y, the same thing here. And here we also get rid of it. So that means we, we just have equality of this term and this term. It's two times the same thing. But then, then we just look to a partial derivative. This is very easy by the chain rule. These things are easy. So if we plug in this here, we are done. Right, so this is by definition of partial derivative. Partial derivative means we, we keep one constant variable and vary the other one. So then we apply chain rule. Uh, okay, so now I have told every, more or less everything I know, I think. 
or at least interesting things I know. Uh, uh, could you please show the previous theory, uh, the theory of the previous slide? Just, yes, ah, yes, this one. Yeah. Uh, well, it's still visible, so when the derivation... So if the relation is correct, then this should, uh, should be true, yeah? Yeah, this but is true. Statement. Yeah, yeah, this is true. This means we can compute marginal distribution from the conditional distribution. And this means that uh, Py and P, um, X given Y are maximally dependent. So if we sum their complexity, it's very big. I mean, why, why is it useful, this, this complex relation? This relation is used to relate minimal description length principle to this method of inference. Okay. So it says that um, this method can be justified by the postulate uh, because of this relation. Briefly, uh, discuss the example with Chichin students test. With? <coughs> can you briefly discuss uh, the um, this theorem in case of two cheating students. Ah, uh, two students. Yeah. Two students. Yeah. Um, okay, so, 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 so now... So we have probability of each uh, letter of word. I don't know what is better. And then what we should do. Yeah. You know if they well, are cheating or not. Yeah, so, but, but then their homework is, uh, let's say, a, a bunch of real numbers. Okay. Um, and then you find that, that at the position of one real number of one student, there is f of x with some error in the other homework. Mm -hmm. Now, if this f of x is not linear, then you will see, so I assume that the other copies from the one student, the copies the numbers. But each time he copies the number, he generates random error. But each time he generates random error in the same way. So this is important. So what does it mean that um, E is independent from X? So wh whatever number he gets random in the same way. And then you can reverse engineer. You can see, so, so you can try to regress the function he was using and then check whether it's, uh, the noise is independent from, from the number itself. Yeah. But in practical way, what should I do? I, I know the function prob of probability of the text e x and text y. Yes, why? And then I should compute the partial derivatives? No, no, no. This is for the justification of the method. Here is the method itself. So you have to compute the regression or independent component analysis or whatever method to get some f and then compare the two types of noise. Okay. Thank you. So which other questions are there? The question about your theorem. Yeah. Uh, is it uh, true if we change Kolmogor complexity to bounded Kolmogor complexity? Well, then it's uh, polynomial time complexity. It's true already because of Sasha's very easy argument. Uh, so, but I don't, we assume that uh, we assume that uh, we don't know about totalization. Yeah, so you, sa you ask what about time-bounded complexity? So we consider m programs that run in polynomial time. Yeah. Yes? So then we only need one round of information. So then we have, well, let's go back to Sasha's. Assuming, assuming, assuming I have one process, way, right? One way, yes, assuming one way function. Maybe. Yes, here we have one way function. So product is one way function. Can you prove something without any complexity assumptions? I don't think this is possible. I, at, at least my result is without any complexity assumptions, but this is a strange result. 
strange but interesting, I find. <laughs> <laughs> I should be careful not to say anything. There is no such result. No. We're talking about the complexity uh, which holds if you can without any complexity or something. If you can prove, if find one wave function, Without any complexity assumption, you will be very famous. This, yeah, this is clear. So that means that you, you find a way to, um, uh, to prove that strong one-way functions exist. Or even weak one-way functions, so where there is logarithmic dif more than super logarithmic difference. Okay, I, I should check the details of this, but... Um, even proving that log a super logarithmic uh, difference is possible, this would be a huge breakthrough. I, I mean in the one round setting, of course, yeah. Okay, so I think then we are finished, right? Okay, then thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all for listening.